Hello and welcome to Rise of the Data Cloud. Today's episode features an interview with Scott Holden, CMO at ThoughtSpot. Scott has been CMO for more than four years, and previous to working at ThoughtSpot, he worked at Salesforce as Vice President of Marketing for Salesforce Platform. On this episode, Scott talks about the third generation of data analytics, why it's important and what it means for business intelligence, natural language search, the future of AI, and much more. So please enjoy this interview between Scott Holden, CMO of ThoughtSpot, and your host, Steve Hamm. Well, Scott, it's good to talk to you today. I notice you're wearing your ThoughtSpot t-shirt, very stylish. And I I think you mentioned something about uh, an anniversary. Tell me about that a little bit. Yeah, hi, Steve. It's, It's great to meet you. And thanks for having me on the show today. I am wearing my ThoughtSpot t-shirt. I'm proud to represent the brand today, especially given today is our eighth anniversary at ThoughtSpot. It's uh, always a special time of year. It happens to coincide with my wedding anniversary, which happened a week ago, so it's easy for me to remember. And uh, I've now been at ThoughtSpot for about five and a half years. So it's been an awesome journey so far and always good to commemorate it once a year. So just to go down memory lane a little bit, I noticed that you minored in philosophy at Colgate. And I think that's really interesting. You know, there's a lot of people dump on the humanities, but I actually, I was an English major. And I I tell people that that my my college education has served me every day of my professional life. So I'm curious about philosophy. How have you used that mental framework in your professional career? You know, I, I absolutely loved my philosophy classes in college. It's probably my favorite subject across the board. And the thing that drew me to it initially was logic. There's something about philosophy that just teaches you how to think and break down arguments, structure them. Uh, I think when you're young, you're trying to figure out the world and put it all together. And so, uh, I, you know, I liked the structure and the logic behind it. I came from a a long family of lawyers, and I did not go that way. But I I think the the thing it taught me most is that it it taught me how to to think, write, and communicate both with clarity and concisely. And that's something, you know, if you think about most of the college papers I was asked to write, oftentimes they'd be, you know, 20-page massive book reports. Whereas the philosophy papers were always intended to be short, you know, try to convey your key points in a few pages. And if I think about how that applies to marketing, it's actually incredibly relevant. I'm not, uh, I'm not putting trial arguments together like my relatives, but I'm making, you know, trying to make clear and concise arguments in the form of messaging and positioning and even in the world of copywriting. I mean, everyone in today's world is trying to get a clear message in as small a bite-sized package as they can get. And so, uh, believe it or not, I think, you know, my background in philosophy in some way or another helped me in what I do today. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I had never thought of marketing in that way as an argument, but you're absolutely right. You're trying to convince somebody of something and usually to buy something. I see you had quite an impressive stint for more than seven years at Salesforce. What was it that took you to ThoughtSpot? Yeah, I had an amazing run at Salesforce. It was, um, you know, I joined the company. It was about 1,500 people. And I left seven and a half years later, it was almost 20,000 people. So I saw it through just tremendous growth and got a world-class education, marketing education throughout that. I was lucky enough to lead the product marketing teams for you know, their core sales product, for their platform business, for the collaboration business. You know, There basically wasn't any job at Salesforce that I didn't have. I ran industry marketing, solutions marketing. I even started out uh, yeah. you know, building the keynote presentations for the CEO, Mark Benioff. You know, I, I've known Mark practically since he was a baby in a way. I, I, I was a journalist in Silicon Valley all through the 90s. And I first met him when he was running the, quote, PC division, which I think was about 10 people at Oracle. It was probably in about 1994, 95. And my, I remember my first impression of him. I, I went in and most Oracle people at that time, you know, wore suits. But I went and he was wearing, 
a cowboy boots and jeans and I, th I think a t-shirt and which you know isn't strange these days for companies but at that time it was it was kind of bizarre but he had kind of a twinkle in his eye and I think he always knew <laughs> he always had a good sense of where the opportunities were and he certainly has shown that in the intervening years yeah it's well it's not uncommon to see Mark especially when he's relaxing and comfortable clothes whether it's cowboy boots or his trademark Hawaiian shirts. But yeah, I, I you know I had an amazing time there and it, the company did phenomenally well. And I think I got to the point where I realized that it was going to probably continue to do phenomenally well, whether I was there or not. And I, mm. you know, I like feeling a sense of contribution. I like feeling like I have a big impact in whatever I do. And as I looked at my, you know, the options in front of me at Salesforce, I, I could have thrown my name in the ring to go after the CMO spot there. I could have gone and tried to be a GM of one of the business units, which at the time was actually probably more attractive to me. But I, I really just love marketing. And I wanted to, you know, continue to get my hands dirty. And I wanted to take on the full responsibility of the CMO role and, you know, live the Silicon Valley dream. You know, start with something small, right. build it into something big and see the, you know, the fruits of my, my efforts in a kind of linear fashion. And so that's uh, what, it, what led me to ThoughtSpot. I met the, the founder and CEO, Ajit Singh, who's now our executive chairman. And, uh, you know, when I was thinking about companies to join, as a marketer, it's, at least for me, it's incredibly important to buy into the vision and the story. And you know, probably most importantly, the problem that you're going after solving in, in the market. And, you know, my background... I started my career as an investment banker, so a bit analytical. And I'd used all the different analytics products out there in the world, and I thought they were all terrible. I'd had many, many painful experiences. And so as much as I was attracted to the market, I, I just thought that the technology would never kind of live up to what I thought it should until I met Ajit. And when he, you know, when he talked to me about ThoughtSpot and the vision, you know, I was absolutely sold on this vision of making analytics as easy as your favorite app. You know, it should be as simple as typing a question into a search box and getting an answer back out of your company data. That, you know, that resonated with me incredibly well. And then the other two key components was that, you know, it's actually, a, it's a really hard problem. There's a reason why, you know, the company was started in 2012 and it hadn't been done before, as obvious, I think, as it sometimes seems to people, is that technically it's a very hard thing to do. So when I met the founding team, you know, there were seven technical co-founders, four of them from Google, uh, a lot of both UX and infrastructure chops that basically gave me the confidence that, you know, this group of folks could really solve what is a very hard problem. And then third, it was a culture. And, um, you know, there, at, at ThoughtSpot, we define our culture as selfless excellence. You know, we put the, the customer and the company and the team ahead of the individual Let's strive to be excellent in everything we do. And, you know, it's a group of uh, incredibly smart and driven people, but also a group of just incredibly humble people. I think that's what stands out most is that, you know, there's a lot less ego and attitude that you might find in some Silicon Valley companies, which is incredibly refreshing and motivating for me. You know, it's interesting. I found that to be true for Snowflake when I first started meeting the team back last December, especially the founders, very humble. Yeah. It's a, you know, it's funny. It's, I think it's a trend too. And, you know, in corporate America and in, you know, trickling into Silicon Valley, you know, being hard and aggressive and take no prisoners type attitude, I think served companies well for a long time, but you know, you're starting to see it more and more in Silicon Valley where humility and, you know, leaders and executives, companies treating, employees and customers like real people and being a little bit more thoughtful in our human interactions. It's a, it's a positive trend. I'm excited to see it uh, developing. Could you start by describing ThoughtSpot's business and its technology? I yeah, absolutely. So ThoughtSpot is a next generation analytics platform, if you want to kind of put us in a category. And you know our, our mission is to make the world a more fact-driven place. So we fundamentally believe that data should be more accessible and the insights that come from that data should be easier for every business person, 
really every person around the world to get access to to make smarter decisions and you know run their businesses and their lives better. And the I guess if you try to unpack that a little bit and and get to know why we're why we're different, why are we unique to the other analytics companies that are out there? Most of the analytics world over the years has been built for technical people. Uh, as as much as folks have you know tried to use the self service label, really analytics was designed for data people. You know the first generation of analytics was about. IT teams building, you know, static reporting on pretty big monolithic systems. The second wave of analytics was around bringing visualizations to data analysts and doing it on desktops and making it more accessible for them to do it on their own. And in this third generation of analytics, we're seeing, you know, business people actually get to interact and ask questions of their data without the help of an expert. And they're able to do it uh, with all the you know kind of perks and the governance and the scale of the bigger systems in the first generation, and that's being enabled by by cloud and enabled through technologies like search and AI. And so you know ThoughtSpot, you know we call ourselves a, a search and AI analytics product. And ultimately, what you know if you think about what that means for people who use our product, we want to make analytics as easy as your favorite app. Essentially, you know. It's often described as you know Google for numbers. You know, we're, we're sitting on all this company data, but it's still shocking how hard it is for people to be able to get answers and to get them quickly. I, you know, we talk to a lot of C-level executives. They're like, "Shouldn't I just be able to, you know, talk to Alexa or Siri or one of these? Just ask a question and get an answer." I was talking to a, a CEO of a famous uh, furniture company just the other day, and. And he said, if, if another person tells me that they're going to get back to me in a day or a week with an answer, I'm going to throw my chair out the window. Can't we just, oh, yeah. can't we just ask, you know, ask a question like Google? And so that's what, that's what we're doing for our customers. And you know, we're working with some of the, the largest companies in the world today, the, the Walmarts of the world, you know, Hulu, Daimler, 7-Eleven, Caterpillar. It's, it's a who's who of some of the biggest companies trying to transform how they use data. So who is the, the typical user and how do they use it kind of in a step-by-step way? Sure. So a typical user, and this is the, this is the key thing, is, is a business person. It's somebody like me, like you, who isn't a data analyst, who isn't incredibly technical and doesn't want to sit in a three-day training class learning how to use a highly sophisticated product. You know, most of the advancements we've seen in analytics, you know, these, these tools have done wonders, there's amazing visualizations you can create, but they're really hard to learn. And so ThoughtSpot, if you can, if you can use a a search engine, you can ask questions of your data and get an answer. And better yet, the, the next kind of big evolution in our industry is what we call AI driven insights. And that's where you can actually get an insight served up to you before you even have to ask. And that's where, you know, basically the system is constantly monitoring large streams of data, understands you, understands your preferences, understands the types of questions that you tend to ask, and provides you with insights about what you would care about before you even have to. And that, you know, for business people, if you think about a lot of us, you know, <laughs> you can kind of get stage fright being, you know, looking at a blank search box. Well, what, what do I want to know? And, you know, AI has an incredible power to be able to, you know, start the ball rolling down the path of data discovery and to do it in a really efficient way over lots of data volume. It seems like there's a convergence between kind of machine learning, AI people and business intelligence people. And I believe that your company, you know, in, when it, in the early days was, was classified as a BI tool. How do you classify it now? And who do you compete with? I mean, I recently on the podcast, we've actually talked to Data Robot, Data IQ, and Tableau, and it seems like things are kind of bleeding one into another. Yeah, they certainly are. And I'll, I'll try to unpack that and give you a sense for where, where we stand. So we traditionally, we are in the you know, BI and analytics category. So we're an analytics product. And you know, as I said, it's our, what, what has made us stand out is that we've targeted very uniquely a business person who, and this is the big difference, 
in most analytics products, the business person is a passive consumer of analytical insights created for them by data analysts. In our world, we see business people being the hero of the narrative where they should be able to ask their own questions and actually be a creator of their own insights. And that that's a fundamental you know, shift from where the analytics market has been. And so, you know, we're still an analytics company. We're just trying to be, uh, you know, one that's a hundred times easier to use than something like a Tableau. And I'd probably Tableau or Power BI. Those are the two biggest companies in the classic BI space. Those would traditionally be the companies that we would compete with. But we're going at things just very differently from them. And so oftentimes you'll have, you know, companies that we work with, they already have Tableau, they already have Power BI. And if they're still struggling to get, you know, answers on the fly to business people, because it's, you know, they're waiting on analysts, not everyone has an analyst at their beck and call, particularly on the front lines. And, um, you know, typically the C-suite likely has an analyst that kind of at their, that does their bidding. But if you think about all of the salespeople, the marketers, the customer service people, the folks managing the logistics out in the warehouse, they don't. And for them, they likely won't get one all that soon either. And so if you can make analytics easy enough where they can get their answers themselves or have AI serve them up answers without them having to ask, you fundamentally change the volume of insights that are floating around an organization and can make you know, a business more fact-driven, smarter, and all the goodness that comes from using all this data that we're sitting on top of come to life. How would a manager of a physical warehouse use your tool? I think now is a is a really good time to look at that, right? In the in we're recording this show today in the COVID era, where the world's just fundamentally changed over the last couple of months and supply chains have been disrupted and businesses are reeling trying to, you know, figure out how to adjust this new normal. You know, I'll give you an example of one of our customers. I won't, um, I won't share the name, but it's one of the world's largest sport shoe manufacturers. And you know, they. I'll give you an example where it ties back to their supply chain. So during this whole COVID uh, scenario, they were looking to launch uh, a new shoe, and one of their marketing managers, you know, not a data analyst, was served up an AI-driven insight from ThoughtSpot that showed her that the shoe they're planning to launch has a shoelace was being manufactured from one of the heavily impacted regions in China, where uh, the shipping times and the production was significantly delayed. And that's something that if, you know, I'm sure somebody probably knew that on the, on the supply chain floor out there in China, but making its way back to the marketing manager who's planning our, all of the, you know, all of the marketing collateral and the websites and the flyers and the advertising spend, you know, that person probably wouldn't get alerted to that as quickly. And so to have a system that's running across all this data, be able to pick out an insight and say, hey, you might have a problem here. They actually delayed the launch. <clears throat> and, w- and knew that they had basically a single point of failure, the classic bottleneck in the supply chain that they needed to wait for if they wanted to have a successful launch and not you know, create a, you know, a nightmare scenario where they've launched a product that their customers want that they can't fulfill. So hopefully that gives you a sense that you know, this is a world where that probably wouldn't have happened um, without the advancements to some of these technologies. That's a wonderful example. Did she put in some kind of natural language query and got this back as a result, or, or was she just alerted to yeah. this by the tool? So the, we have a, a technology built into the ThoughtSpot platform that's pervasive, and it's our, it's our AI engine. We call it Spot IQ for all the ThoughtSpot users out there who are familiar with it. And it's pervasive. So it's, it's in a number of different places throughout the application, and I'll, I'll give a couple of examples to help bring it to life. So when you log in, our homepage looks a lot like YouTube or Spotify. There are insights that you've looked at most recently in the form of charts or tables. There's things that other people are looking at. There, you have the ability in our system to follow metrics. And you also have right there, it's in essence like on YouTube, it'd be recommended insights. You know, we call them, you know, Spot IQ 
AI-driven insights that are served up to you on your homepage. Mm -hmm. And so you can find them there. And it's, you know, thing, it's based on the types of data sets that you tend to look at. It's based on data sets like other people like you that have a profile like you in the system look at. It's based on queries like natural language queries that you might have asked in the past. And so we're constantly serving those up for you like right on the homepage when you log in. If you then go ask a question of ThoughtSpot and use our, you know, our, our search engine that we're so known for, right at the bottom of the search result, you'll also have related searches, if you will, which are, again, AI-driven insights that could have, I don't know the precise place where this woman saw it, but it could have been there related to another query that she'd asked. We have the ability after you type a search, it'll create an answer. You can just pin it to the dashboard, sort of like you might pin a photo to you know, a Pinterest pin board we've borrowed from the consumer world there. And on our pin boards, you have you know, also insights to pop up. And then finally, there's, there's a, probably my favorite thing actually, is there's a part of the application where if you're looking at a chart or you're looking at an insight anywhere, you can actually invoke Spot IQ and ask it to auto analyze a data point or a chart, or you can actually ask it to analyze an entire data set if you want. But I particularly like to aim it at you know, something that is specific. So it might be a trend line, it could be a particular metric, and ask it to auto analyze that. And what happens in the background is that this is where the power of, of cloud and massive compute basically goes out and crunches all of the data behind whatever data point I'm looking at, and will essentially run drills in every dimension that the data exists, and then apply you know, a number of different algorithms on top of that to highlight insights based on my preferences that are likely to be relevant to me. And so in a matter of seconds, it basically builds for you an entire dashboard of it could be you know, 40 insights, depending on how you've set it up. And you know, we often describe it as it's like having the power of a thousand analysts in your pocket. You know, it's uh, you know, to, to borrow from the, the famous iTunes iPod metaphor, but it, it literally does, you know, the work of a thousand analysts in seconds. And that to me, if you're trying to understand the why behind, why, you know, why are we behind? Why are we ahead? You know, what caused that dip or what caused, you know, our business to go in a new direction? It's incredibly powerful because essentially it's a, it's a why engine at the click of a button. Mm -hmm. When something's initiated by the user, it's basically a question answering machine that, that, that does search. Our product is, you know, it's a search box just like Google, but if you ask it questions, you type in English, you know, you know, what were sales last week by product in North America, it translates your question in English into SQL on the back end. And what makes, I think what pe get people get confused by on initial glance is they think that when we search that we're actually serving up answers that someone's built before. And while we can do that, the thing that makes ThoughtSpot such a, a unique and, and powerful technology is it's, a, it's an entirely new breed of search engine that actually goes into the raw tables based on what you asked and calculates an answer on the fly, pits, picks a best fit visualization, and presents that to you all in less than a second. And that's where, you know, the reason why I think ThoughtSpot has come into existence here in the last eight years is that it, it really required both the UX advancement plus a computing power advancement for, to bring these two things together. And we just didn't have the compute power to be able to do this type of analysis before. So it's computing power and it's a tremendous amount of variety of data that you were able to bring together. Are you mainly operating on the cloud or, or do you have on-premises versions or kind of what's the... How are you seeing the cloud develop and the data cloud develop? Yeah. So, you know, we started off, you know, offering choice. And we, you know, we've always believed that, especially with our client-based, the large enterprise, some of our customers have, you know, their, their data warehouses on-premise. Some of them, you know, run them on their own private clouds. Some of them are taking advantage of the, the move to, you know, SaaS and, and pure play cloud offerings. And so we've, we've sort of evolved with the needs of our customer base. And, you know, we started in the, the on-prem and private cloud worlds and are now as a company moving towards SaaS. And in, if I think about our partnership with Snowflake, 
one, there's a kind of a key learning and the reason why our whole partnership developed in the first place. And it's really driving a fundamental shift in, in the marketplace, which is when we set out to build ThoughtSpot, we actually, you know, wanted to deliver this, you know, Google like search experience on company data. And the problem with it is that we just couldn't find uh, basically databases that were fast enough to do it. And so after lots of searching, actually the founding team decided to build their own in-memory database to speed up queries on top of slower databases that our customers had. And so that was sort of our initial go-to-market motion. And then with the advent of Snowflake, we've actually realized that the speed was there to be able to send our queries that we you know, translate from English into SQL directly into the source data warehouse. It's a product we call ThoughtSpot Embrace, where we embrace the external data warehouse like Snowflake and query that data directly and serve up answers in that same you know, sub-second consumer-like experience that people expect. And so it's been, um, you know, it's been a real fantastic transition for us as a company and partnering with Snowflake to be able to do something that when I joined the company, you know, just five years ago, wasn't possible. And this is, and I think this is what, you know, I think everyone's always thought that the world is going to cloud. It's just a question of how fast. And even a couple of years ago, you know, I was sitting at a Gartner conference and, you know, the last two, three, four years watching the classic question get asked where people raise their hands and say, you know, are you planning to move to the cloud? And it was really last year where I saw a meaningful uptick where I think, you know, companies like Snowflake have proven that people are ready because they see the speed, they see the flexibility of the pricing model, the elasticity, the consumption-based pricing. And it's just fundamentally changing how people uh, view how they're going to access data. And we're you know, partnering with Snowflake to take advantage of that. And we basically, you know, typically sit on top of a data warehouse and make accessing all that data easy for the non-technical folks as we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine that this COVID-19 crisis is really accelerating the migration of data to the cloud. Are you seeing that in your business? Absolutely. It's been eye-opening. And I think that's been one of the biggest things that we've done is that, you know, analytics and data is something that even in a crisis companies need, they just tend to, they might perhaps have slightly different things that they want to look at. And so we've spent a lot of time working with our customers on, you know, workforce management, on business continuity, on, you know, working capital supply chains, as we talked about. So really kind of helping them with the things that are most pressing. I'll give another example. We're working with a company that it's a, provider of revenue management for hospitals and HMOs and basically helps them collect, you know, their accounts receivable and manages that part of their business for them. And so as you can imagine during COVID, a lot of these hospitals, you know, some of them have been under incredible duress, but a lot of the doctors aren't working because hospitals have elected not to do elective procedures. And so it's a shame because a lot of our best healthcare workers are actually sitting idle in places where, the COVID hasn't hit as hard. And so that's really caused these, these hospitals to look at both, you know, where are, where's our cash collection coming from? And, uh, and also then try to plan ahead to say, when we do open, what procedures are we going to uh, attempt to do first, knowing kind of how, what's going to impact the business and drive it, you know, forward if they have a choice. And so that, you know, we worked with this, this company recently and they, um, we literally met them in February and have just started working with them and they're a customer of Snowflake as well. And so it's been a great combined effort where basically inside of a month, we've been able to get an entirely new solution set up for them to be able to ask questions like which customers payments are due this month that are over 30 days old and for their business leaders to be able to, you know, dive into that data data and you know the beauty of thoughtspot and you know powered by snowflake and this example is that you know you can right click and drill into any piece of data anywhere and so to be able to kind of dissect by by customer by procedure and be able to know how to pivot in these times has been you know a game changer for them have you changed your marketing strategy or execution during this crisis 
We sure have. And, you know, it's been, I can honestly say that our marketing team has never worked harder than during this time frame. It's been, you know, about 40% of our marketing activities tend to be event driven. And so obviously with everybody inside their homes, that's not happening. And so it's, it's caused us to, you know, pivot like every other marketing company or marketing team out there and move to virtual virtual events. We've dialed up our digital advertising and, and virtual events and come up with all kinds of new formats for events. And I, it's so far, you know, the combination of new use cases and, you know, new virtual event formats, so far so good. People are still very interested in analytics. And so we have found a way to reach them, even though some of our paths have been cut off. What's the newest virtual event strategy or technique that's being tried? I just presented on this the other day to the company. We've got a sort of a, an a la carte menu <laughs> of four or five different formats that we're offering now, depending on you know the customer and you know their evolution and their journey with us and what we're trying to achieve. Things that range from private events that we'll host for some of our customers to you know what I call a mass virtual event, where you're you know you're trying to you know get thousands of people engaged. In that, in that arena, you're starting to see some pretty interesting things in the form of augmented reality. And people are throwing events where you, know, you can kind of interact with it like you might a video game. It's on the, the cusp of being cute, clever, but I've seen some early results. And so that's something that I've actually taken a look at and we're starting to explore. But really it comes down to who's, you know, who's the audience, what's the format, are you trying to you know, blast and reach a, a wide range or are you trying to create an intimate dynamic. I love seeing these, you know, lunches with families, you know, groups getting together over wine or dinner. There's actually a, especially for busy executives, getting them together is often tricky. And so with people generally at home, we've seen it actually be easier to coordinate and get people together. And uh, yeah, it's one of the side benefits of this whole scenario. I hadn't thought of that. Hey, so how are you using data analytics to come up with new marketing schemes and also figure out which ones are working and which ones aren't? Well, I like to consider myself patient zero, if you will, with, with ThoughtSpot. And so I was one of the very first yeah. teams to get up and running on the technology. And so I'm in it every day. And I've just never had access to data like I have with this product. It's been unbelievable. And the thing I think that probably gets me most excited about it is that I have people in my marketing team and, and you know, now and across our whole company uses the product, the types of people that are asking sophisticated data questions and using data to make decisions. It's honestly something that you would have never seen just as short as five years ago. You know, when you have a field marketer come to you and say, you know, I know that this campaign that we launched looks like it's doing really well because it's getting a lot of leads, but this other one over here has been getting fewer, but the cost is more effective. And we're seeing that these leads are translating into down funnel at a much higher conversion rate. So on an adjusted basis, this campaign is actually a better performer than the one that's got everybody's attention with the big numbers. And when that starts coming from people that don't have any analytics background, just because they're playing with data and looking at data more regularly, you know, it's sort of like being a, a proud parent. It's amazing. And I don't have a data analyst on my marketing team. We're a 30 plus person marketing organization now. At this scale, normally I would. And it's a testament to how easy the technology has gotten that you don't need to have a data person do all the work if the user experience is easy enough that everyone on the team can do it. So you don't have to spend a lot of time training people on the, on the tool, but in a sense, do you have to train them to think differently about analytics and about what's possible with data? It's interesting. We just sponsored some really good research uh, that came out a couple weeks ago. We partnered with the Harvard Business Review and launched a you know, big, big brand campaign for us. It's called Meet the New Decision Makers. And the whole concept is that People on the front lines, if they can get access to data, they're going to move your business forward faster. They're the ones who are interacting with customers. They're, in, they're on the front lines of the supply chain. They're, you know, they're the marketers. And today, they just don't have easy access. And so we, this research, we found that you know, the stat was 86% of companies 
90% of companies want to do this, which is not surprising, or they want to be data-driven. 86% of them don't think they have the technology they need to get it done. Uh, and only 7% thought that they were on the right path. And so we got this, this great research that showed across every dimension you'd imagine, productivity, engagement, customer satisfaction, you know, being data-driven improves all of those things. Being data-driven is partly a cultural yeah, thing. Yeah, so that's right? where I was going with it is that, is that you know, obviously the, the data behind it is, is affirming, but probably the most interesting part of it was, and the reason why we're excited about it is that oftentimes people think technology is the silver bullet and it's, n- it's not. It has to be technology paired with strategy, culture, talent, and training. And in the report, you know, if you if you go to you know ThoughtSpot, you'll see ThoughtSpot.com. You'll see the research front and center on our homepage or at ThoughtSpot.com/slash decision makers, and uh, it unpacks sort of five key tips for how business leaders can think about driving change through data. And number one is strategy. Like you have to believe it. And this is the thing that probably stood out to me as the most surprising in the whole the whole piece of research was that it broke the respondents down between leaders and laggards. And one of the things that really stood out was that the leaders were 10 times more likely to actually want to put data in the hands of frontline employees. Shockingly, 40% of the laggards didn't want to do it at all, like didn't see the value of putting data in the hands of frontline people. And so that, from a strategy perspective, the first of all, it comes with like, okay, yes, we believe in doing this. Second is, as a leader, the leadership team needs to be bought in and actually want to drive change. And then it really comes down to not just thinking about the tech, although the tech's a big part of it, but also the cultural changes, which is where I think your question's driving. What do you need to do to make people appreciate it? And then how do you, A, train them and B, facilitate them? And so what I've seen work best is that, you know, assuming you've got, you know, people want to do it, leadership's bought in, giving them both the right uh, inspiration in the form of showing them that the leaders care and are looking at data. And I find that when leaders look at data and try to, and, and show that they want to make data-driven decisions, it has a remarkable impact on those beneath them. And then setting up the right training and also facilitation. So how are you making sure that managers are training each other and that managers are facilitating for the people on their teams and being able to do all of that intentionally. And so it, it kind of unpacks that in the research. And it's the thing that gets me excited about this is that when we talk to some of these big companies, oftentimes it's that softer side of things more than just the tech that they really want to understand. Well, ThoughtSpot has been a partner, a business partner of Snowflake for several years, but I understand you're not yet a customer but I know you're considering it. So what, what, oh, what I can't do you wait have? to become a customer. And so we absolutely will be. It's in the works for us right now. And I'd say that we've been able to make it work so far without you all, but it's been kind of painful and a lot of work on some of the, you know, some of the data engineers on our team. And so I checked in on the progress today, knowing I was speaking with you and I got a very positive response that things are, are lining up well. So there's, You know, especially for marketing organizations today, if I think, you know, in my business, you know, we're looking at, you know, we want to track campaign performance across the website. We want to look at campaign data that often comes from a marketing automation system. There's, you know, Salesforce data about opportunities in your pipeline. Uh, There's the whole advertising network of data coming out of Google and LinkedIn and, you know, your ad syndicates. And all of that needs to come together to give you a holistic view along with your spend information to be able to help you as a marketer understand how your campaigns and your business is performing. And, you know, Snowflake is a, is a beautiful platform to be able to bring all those insights together as well as third party insights, so third party data sets. So, you know, we're seeing our customers now bring in Nielsen data and weather data. COVID-19 data is obviously something that people are doing right now across the board. And so to have, you know, a platform like Snowflake help us do that and to do it, in a more robust way than what we've currently are using is something that's super exciting for me because I'm, I think the future of, you know, how I will run my business is going to be having all of that data in one place. And I, I, I'm envisioning a world where, you know, I, (laughs) we affectionately like 
dream of it inside ThoughtSpot is self-driving analytics, where I don't, I don't actually ever have to log in. I just get notifications on my phone that say, did you know that today this campaign is up X percent and here are the reasons why? And here's some suggestions for what you might want to do uh, in the future. And the, you know, I think that's the nirvana that we're all heading toward. In order to get there, you've got to have all the data in one place. And it needs to be fast enough to be able to serve you those insights in the moment when you can actually use your expertise as a person to turn them in action. So you mentioned the future, and I think that's a really cool vision of the self-driving analytics. If you could kind of cast, say, five years even further into the future, where do you see data analytics for marketing going? What new things will marketers be able to do then that they can't do today? Well, I think, I mean, that is my vision, this self-driving analytics concept. And, you know, I, today, you know, our founder often likes to say that we're just 2% done and we'll always be 2% done. And it's one of the fun things about working in this industry is that, you know, data and analytics has so much potential, but we've really just scratched the surface and everything, you know, despite all the progress we've made over the last, you know, 30, 40 years that analytics has existed, we're really just getting started. And so that vision of being able to have, you know, an alert on your phone, tell me that the campaign I just launched yesterday is performing better in this region than planned uh, because of these factors, whether it's by channel or by the type of company that's responding or the seniority of the title that's responding. These are things that typically marketers, marketers today can spend months analyzing post facto I envision a world where the day after you launch, you're getting updates on those things and you're not, and you're not asking anyone to do it. The system's proactively serving that up to you and it's pulling those insights from all kinds of different data systems. So, you know, I think the last frontier for marketers is that it's historically been really hard to get data out of the advertising platforms and to be able to pair it with all of the internal systems you have for launching campaigns and tracking sales opportunities. And so that I think is going to be, you know, popped open and, and likely brought into a centralized data warehouse like Snowflake. And, you know, if you can have a UX experience like ThoughtSpot where you can, as a business person, can either ask a question over Siri or Alexa or just get served up as a push alert on your phone, I think it, it just changes the game radically for business people. Yeah. Well, that's a really exciting vision of the future, Scott. I want to thank you so much for your time today your stories and your insights and your examples uh, of what you do with data and how you use it and how your customers use it have really been fascinating and, and I think edifying. So thanks for your I time. appreciate it. It's always a lot of fun. That does it for this episode of Rise of the Data Cloud. Thank you for listening. This episode is brought to you by Snowflake. To see how you can get secure and easy access to any data with near infinite scalability, visit snowflake.com.